Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm honored and privileged to introduce our distinguished lecture series speaker, Amwadal Rafai. I serve as the chair of surgery at Kuwait University School of Medicine and CHI Health. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to thank Dr. Savolas for inviting our distinguished speaker and inviting me to um, introduce um, you as well. So today we have um, the privilege and honor to um, host uh, Dr. Alejandro Sweet Cordero from UCSF. Uh, in many ways, Dr. Sweet Cordero doesn't need introduction, but I want to walk you through his accomplishment and how lucky we are to have him today. He cares for children with cancer. He specializes in the treatment of sarcoma, a type of cancer that originates in the bone and or soft tissue, an area that is very near and dear to myself and Dr. Gillespie, our founder and chief of thoracic surgery. Um, and he also treats advanced cancer through precision medicine, which is the use of patients' genetic data to optimize therapy. In research, Dr. Sweet Cordero has two areas of focus. One is he studies ways to use gene sequencing data from tumors to inform treatment decisions. Specifically, he directs the UCSF molecular oncology initiatives, which uses such data in determining best treatments for relapse, growing to other treatment cases. His second area of research interest is where he runs his research to dedicate uh, new finding therapies for sarcoma, particularly osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma, one of the toughest area uh, in pediatrics uh, oncology. Um, Dr. Sweet Cordero earned his medical degree from UCSF, where he also completed a residency in pediatrics. He completed a fellowship in pediatrics oncology at the Dana-Farber Boston uh, Children's Institute and then the Blood Disorder Center. A native Spanish speaker, Sweet Cordero enjoys working with the Spanish-speaking community and their family. He appreciates the diversity of UCSF patient population and how it reflects on the Bay Area's cultural diversity. In his free time, he enjoys spending time with his family, friends, cooking, and reading. Today, um, Dr. Cordero will talk to us about the clinical utility of genomic analysis and oncology, the UCSF experience. Thank you so much for joining us. An honor to have you today. So Tom's been a friend for uh, many, many years, and, and, uh, and I'm really happy to be here. And, and uh, he talks a lot about uh, Creighton and Oman how much he loves it here. So it's great to be here and, and see it firsthand. So I'm really, uh, really looking forward to this visit. Um, <clears throat> so I thought what I would do uh, for this talk is talk a little bit about um, our experience at UCSF applying genome sequencing as a tool uh, in the care of uh, uh, cancer patients. Um, as uh, uh, was mentioned, I run the um, uh, something called the Molecular Oncology Initiative, which is basically has two parts. One is um, a molecular tumor board where both adult and pediatric cases uh, that have been sequenced um, using the tool that I'm gonna describe in a few minutes um, um, are discussed by experts in the presence of the clinicians who order the test uh, with the goal of helping um, clinicians interpret the, the sequencing results um, in the context of their patient's needs. And then the other part of the molecular oncology initiative, which I'll also touch on, is um, developing infrastructure for data analytics so that we can analyze the, the data um, that, we've, that we are generating um, in the course of this um, sequencing effort. We've now um, sequenced, I think, close to uh, 8,000 cases. And so building the infrastructure to analyze that data um, is what I'm gonna talk to you about today. So I have uh, no relevant financial relationships. I uh, thought I would start with just a few questions that hopefully, um, I, I know this is a pretty broad audience and maybe some of these topics are not things that you think about all the time, um, but just a few questions that you can be thinking about as I go through the, the lecture. Um, so what, one question is, what are the major clinically relevant categories of findings that we can identify from tumor sequencing? What is a tumor mutational burden? Um, and how is that different between adult and pediatric cancers? Um, and what are three major drivers of high tumor molecular burden? Um, what is a mutational signature and how it might be clinically relevant? Uh, and then and lastly, uh, defining some barriers for the clinical application of the sequencing data in the real world practice of oncology. So I'm gonna start a little bit by talking about uh, introduction to cancer clinical sequencing, an overview of the UCSF uh, effort, uh, and then some uh, clinical insights uh, that we think we've gained from this effort. So um, just to remind everybody that, uh, you know, those of you who are involved in oncology know this, but maybe those of you who are not, uh, this is new to you. The, um, there's been an increasing number of, um, 
of sequencing-based biomarkers you know, back 20 or 30 years ago, clinical trials were mostly based on the diagnosis, right? So the histologic diagnosis under the microscope was what defined what kind of clinical trial you were eligible for. But now, um, uh, thanks to the explosion of uh, precision oncology um, and the sequencing efforts, such as the ones I'm going to describe to you in a few minutes, uh, there are uh, now a very large number of diagnostic biomarkers, uh, some of which are indicated here, uh, treatment uh, biomarkers, um, and also prognostic biomarkers. And so many of those are covered <clears throat> by sequencing assays, uh, which are now pretty widely available. Um, I haven't had a chance to talk to folks here about which one uh, you typically use, but um, I'll, I'll talk to you mostly about the one we use at UCSF. Um, so again, this is just an, another example. Uh, over the last you know, couple of decades, the number of biomarker-driven clinical trials that are now available to patients. Um, uh, and this uh, relates also to uh, these biomarkers being uh, relevant to defining novel therapies um, and novel drugs. And so you, you can see here, for example, one thing that I'll mention throughout this talk, so I'll just talk about it briefly here, are these different levels um, that we think about when we think about actionability of a molecular finding. So level one is something that's FDA approved for that indication. Level two is something that is FDA approved uh, or standard of care um, uh, biomarker. Um, number three is uh, level three is a compelling clinical evidence uh, for response to a drug. And level four is um, uh, compelling uh, preclinical evidence. So we use that information to guide you know, uh, the, the, um, the recommendations for, uh, for a given patient. Uh, there's also been, as you, I'm sure you're aware, uh, explosion really in the number of uh, targeted therapies available for patients. Um, so this is just over the last, again, last couple of decades, the number of, uh, of uh, approved targeted agents every year. Uh, some of the more uh, um, well-known recent ones are shown below. Uh, Pembrolizumab, which is now approved for uh, uh, tumor, TMB high or MSI high in both adult and pediatric cancer. Lorotrectinib, which is approved for both adult and pediatric uh, intract effusions. Um, and, and a large number of, of other ones. So, so where does this all take us, or what, what is the goal of all this? So this um, is a slide that we put together for a review that I published with uh, Dr. Beagle a few years ago um, with the kind of the, the vision of where we think cancer genomics in, in clinical medicine should go. So to the, on the left hand, you have this sort of wheel of a you know, patient comes in uh, with a tumor, uh, we, we like to have a comprehensive way of analyzing that tumor so that we can analyze not only point mutations, but also copy number changes, mutational signatures, which I'm going to talk about, gene expression, uh, and other aspects of the omics of that tumor so that we can best define the best treatment uh, at that time. And then if that patient um, uh, relapses, we want to be able to do the same thing uh, at relapse to look at the, uh, the deltas in those, uh, those elements. So what are the changes in gene expression? What are potential new copy number changes uh, that are relevant to the care of that patient at relapse. And we have to also want to think, and one thing that I'll mention is we think not only of the, the tumor itself, but also the context of the germline for that patient. So uh, does that patient have a genetic predisposition, uh, which is becoming more evident that those, you know, the many patients do. Um, and also other aspects, for example, drug metabolism, genetic ancestry, um, uh, and uh, how does that also relate to the imaging findings uh, and other aspects of that patient's care? So at UCSF, we, we apply this uh, through this uh, effort that I lead called the Molecular Oncology Initiative, which is really our effort to link uh, clinical care uh, also with discovery uh, and advancing precision oncology so that we can take what we learn from one patient, uh, put that into, uh, um, you know, through uh, various analytic methods so that we can um, then learn from those patients and apply that knowledge to new patients as they come in. So we think of this as sort of the, the wheel between clinical care and discovery. So a patient comes in, uh, gets genomic testing, that uh, genomic result gets discussed in molecular tumor board, a treatment is selected, we can monitor re response to the treatment, identify, for example, exceptional responders, put that information into, um, uh, into databases that we can then use for research, develop novel clinical trials, um, um, devise new therapies and guidelines, and then have that sort of population level data that we can apply to new patients as they come in. So uh, uh, the specific assay that I'm going to talk to you about today, again, as I said, there's 
multiple commercial versions of this as well, Foundation Medicine, Tempest, uh, Keras, uh, they all have sort of similar tests. At UCSF, we made the decision uh, before I started this effort, um, before I joined this effort, but maybe six, seven or eight years ago, the decision was made <clears throat> to develop a sort of a homegrown assay. And I'll talk about the sort of advantages of that in a minute. But basically, the homegrown assay that we developed, we call the UCSF 500. Um, and the way we, we run it is a um, specimen that is received. We try to collect both the tumor and the normal, the germline for that patient. And the germline can be very uh, helpful for a variety of reasons, which I'll mention. Then there's a sort of a wet lab processing of that sample. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, sequencing, um, the analytics, the bioinformatic analysis, which is um, equally important. And then that generates a clinical report, uh, which is um, interpreted by a molecular pathologist. And then that <clears throat> is brought to the molecular tumor board where we discuss it um, with my team. And so some of the characteristics of our particular UCSF 500 assay, it covers about, it's actually, even though it's the, we call the, we call the UCSF 500, a little bit more than 500 genes. We cover the exons of about 529 cancer-relevant genes. We also tile across the introns so to be able to capture uh, fusion events, which are very important, uh, particularly in pediatric, but also in some adult cancers. Um, uh, we sequence to a depth of about 500x so that we can identify not only clonal mutations, but potentially uh, clinically relevant subclonal mutations. Uh, the current panel uh, has about... Um, a footprint of about six megabases. So it's actually one of the largest panels out there if you compare it to some of the, the uh, commercial panels. The turnaround time is about 14 days and that turns out to be very, very important, particularly for some, uh, some diseases like uh, lung cancer where there's a very, very clear um, pathway for um, uh, what to do with the findings from this report. You really need to be able to turn it around to the clinicians with that turnaround time. And that's uh, pretty standard for um, across the, um, the commercial assays as well uh, these days. Um, uh, as I said, we do tumor normal, uh, not just tumor when we can. Although I should say that uh, it may be surprising to some of you that um, getting the normal actually oftentimes turns out to be more difficult than getting the, the tumor. Uh, with tumor, you know, we can work closely with the surgeons and get the sample out. Uh, with the normal, oftentimes you need to uh, have that patient come back to the clinic or send a saliva kit to their home various reasons why oftentimes we don't get the normal. Um, and right now at UCSF, we're, um, we're uh, analyzing somewhere between 70 and 90 uh, reports a, a week. So, um, uh, you know, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty significant numbers. Uh, so the, the report uh, that we generate is, is uh, here's an example. Uh, again, these are very similar to the reports you might see from foundation or other assays. Um, at the top, we have a, we have kind of break it up into two parts, the top part, is the somatic alterations. <clears throat> so for example, this patient has a mutation in APC and a, and a mutation in PR, uh, PRMN1. Uh, we report the, um, whether it's, we consider pathogenic or likely pathogenic, the, the number of reads um, and the uh, mutant allele frequency gives you a sense of whether it's clonal or subclonal. And then we have a separate section down below where we report the germline findings. So this is an interesting case in that there's a, a germline alteration in BRCA2 uh, and then a second hit uh, on, the, on the other allele of bracket two are most likely the, the second allele um, uh, for, the, for this patient. Um, uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, we, we, we spent a lot of time on developing infrastructure uh, for analytics and for data sharing. We have an internal uh, way to do that, which is um, through a platform called CBioPortal, which was developed by Sloan Kettering, which we applied locally. And we have a local build for that. You probably can't see it here, but basically this allows you to look through all of the um, now more than um, 8,000 cases that have been sequenced, you can look to see your particular disease of interest. If you were, for example, interested in a clinical trial and you wanted to know how likely is it that I'm gonna be able to accrue to that trial because you know we have this many patients a year that we see with uh, this combination of a diagnosis and a specific biomarker, you could easily go in there and find that and, and then decide whether the clinical trial is gonna accrue in six months or whether it's gonna take you six years to find that number of patients. We also are part of something called the Genie uh, Collaborative, which is a American Association for Cancer Research sponsored um, program uh, that shares data uh, across uh, a large number of institutions across the US. Um, anybody can go into the Genie version of CBAR portal and, and, uh, and look at not just our data, but the data from 
uh, MD Anderson, uh, Dana Farber, Sloan Kettering, um, and a, a number of other institutions, both uh, in the US um, and internationally. So, um, and then this next part of the talk, I'm going to kind of walk you through some of the summary of, of the results that we've obtained and sort of the highlights, some of which I, uh, might be interesting to you uh, for both the pediatric and the adult cases. So, as a pediatric oncologist, I have a strong interest in pediatric cancer. Uh, one of the things I like about UCSF is that um, uh, pediatrics is a really an integral part of our cancer center and an integral part of our, our research effort. And so um, myself as a, as a pediatric oncologist, I was able to kind of break out with, our, with my analytic team, break out the results from the adult and pediatric and kind of do some interesting comparisons, I think, between what you see uh, in, an, in, pedi in a pediatric cancer versus what you see in adult cancer. So, I should mention that, so this is um, maybe uh, uh, just to kind of walk you through this figure. So on the left hand, we have bubbles for the, the size of the cohort for the different age groups. So zero to nine, 10 to 18, and 19 to 32. And you might ask, well, why do you have 19 to 32 in a, in a, in a pediatric data set? So we include here cases that we see on the pediatric side, even though uh, the patient is over 18. Diagnoses that usually come to us, like osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, as was mentioned earlier. Some of the uh, young adults with, um, Leukemias come to the pediatric side because um, we have an open trial that is open to young adults. Uh, so that's why we have that. <clears throat> we also have a somewhat of a skewed uh, representation here because uh, we have a very large brain tumor program at UCSF and they were early adopters um, to the uh, UCSF 500 assay. Uh, and they get a lot of referrals, um, not just for patients that are being cared for at UCSF, but patients that are referred to us for molecular diagnostics. So they may be taken care of at um, um, uh, we, got, we get a lot of patients from Utah, for example, uh, a lot of patients from Miami, that the pathologist has a question about the diagnosis, so they will send this sample to us. So this doesn't mean that we've seen all of these 1,000 patients at UCSF. It just means that they've been referred for molecular testing. So then we break it down by different diagnoses. Uh, so as I mentioned, osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, uh, various other pediatric diagnoses. And then we report here the number of cases where we were able to get the tumor normal. So if it's black, it means we have the the, uh, the tumor normal. If it's gray, it means we have only the tumor. And then whether it was a metastatic tumor or a primary tumor, um, I should say that this we have actually significantly more data. This is uh, up to about two years ago, and we cut it off there because we're about to publish a manuscript where we describe this data, and we kind of had to do a, a cutoff so we can do all the, the analysis that kind of goes behind this. Uh, but these are the cases that we've reported for pediatrics. Um, and uh, this is kind of diving a little bit into the molecular findings, summarizing the molecular findings in terms of uh, whether there was a, a patho pathologic or likely pathogenic um, alteration seen in that patient. And I'll walk you through the adult data, but one thing you'll notice is that in pediatrics, we have a, a lower percentage of patients that have a point mutation. So most adult pediatric cancers as opposed to adult cancers don't have a pathogenic point mutation, say in, uh, uh, in uh, EGFR or in in KRAS or something like that. Uh, most of the uh, pediatric cancers are actually driven by either by fusions, as you can see here, for example, with Ewing's, almost all of them have the canonical Ewing fusion, a large number of other fusions, uh, copy number changes, or epigenetic things that are actually not, uh, epigenetic alterations that are actually not covered by this assay since this is really a, just a DNA sequencing assay. Um, here you can see a summary of the most common alterations that we see in the pediatric cohort. The top one, uh, somewhat um, maybe not surprising, but somewhat frustrating, is it's, since it's not a druggable alteration, is um, mutations or alterations in p53. That's about uh, almost a little bit under 20% of the cohort. BRAF is also commonly altered, the most commonly altered oncogene. That's probably a little bit of a skew because we have such a large uh, brain tumor population. Most of the patients are brain tumors. Um, but th these are the most common alterations. And one of the things that Again, I was, as, I, as I mentioned, that's a little bit frustrating in the pediatric cohort is that most of these things are not things that we could actually identify a drug for. So P53, BRAF being the exception, but CDK, N2A, and 2 b those are tumor suppressors, HDRX, NF1, TURT, those are all things that are not really druggable. Um, and then here on the right, you just see the um, summary of the, what kind of alteration is more common, uh, whether it's in the, in the gene itself, whether it's a fusion, whether it's in the promoter. So for example, uh, for TERT, almost all of these alterations are alterations to a, is a point mutation in the promoter that alters the expression of that gene, um, but that doesn't mean that it's a druggable alteration. 
Um, uh, and the adult cohort, cohort obviously is much larger. Uh, here's a figure kind of summarizing the similar uh, um, data as I showed you before for the pediatric cohort. Um, we have many fewer patients where we were able to get the tumor normal. So despite our efforts to really get the tumor uh, normal pair, uh, we only succeed in about uh, a little bit over 25% of the cases. Um, and the reason why we care so much about the germline is for a couple of things. One is obviously germline alterations that would identify a genetic predisposition. That's the obvious one. The other one is that it actually turns out that, for example, for measuring things like tumor mutational burden, you need to have the germline because otherwise you're comparing it to the, what we call the so-called standard reference. Um, and you would be overcalling the tumor mutational burden because a lot of the things you would be identifying would just be um, SNPs that are different between the reference genome and that individual person's genome. So it's always better to have the reference genome for that individual rather than sort of a generic um, uh, reference, which is why we, we push so hard to get the, the tumor normal, but we don't always succeed. So um, in the adult cohort, uh, as opposed to the pediatric, as I mentioned before, much higher percentage of SNVs, so single nucleotide uh, variants, point mutations, uh, which are found almost in, uh, in almost all cases of adult cancer. Um, CNVs, which are copy number variations, are also common. Fusions are much less common, except for example, prostate cancer, which has this kind of well-known uh, temporous ERG fusion. Um, and then the list of most common alterations, Similar, but a little bit different in the, um, in the adult cohort. So P53 is still the most common gene, maybe not surprising to anybody. Uh, TERT is more common in the adult cohort and pediatrics. Uh, EGFR, KRAS, things like that that are, um, tend to be more uh, druggable, uh, especially these days with the advent of KRAS mutations. And then the other thing to point out is that, especially for those of you who are not uh, um, oncologists, is that there are some things that you'll notice are common across all diseases. So for example, um, P53, um, you know, the color here indicates the percentage, the fraction of, patients, of cases that have a mutation. Very high percentage, uh, higher in the adult cohort, 42%, as opposed to the pediatric cohort. <clears throat> but then there are other things, uh, for example, these genes here, GNAQ and GNA11, that are almost exclusively found in uh, tumors of the eye. Uh, and there's other examples of that. So the temporous fusion, as I mentioned, is seen almost exclusively in prostate cancer, ERG alteration, so it's the temporous ERG fusion. So that's also um, pretty much exclusive to, to uh, prostate cancer. APC is almost always seen in, in colon cancer. So there are, these, there are some mutations that are kind of pan-cancer, and there are some that are just seen in one tumor and not in others. Um, this slide summarizes our, our analysis of the fusion. So as I mentioned, the UCSF 500 uh, you might think that you need an RNA-based assay to identify fusions, but if you tile across the introns, you can actually identify most of the clinically relevant fusions. So the, the UCSF 500 test is a DNA-only test, or at least it was until when I, up to when I put these slides together. Just in the last few months, we've started to um, incorporate RNA sequencing. And so we do identify now some cases where there was a fusion in that patient that was not identified by telling across the intron, but we do see it in the RNA. Uh, but so, so for the pediatric cohort, as I mentioned, we have a very large uh, brain tumor cohort. So the uh, KIAA1549 BRAF fusion, which is very commonly seen in low-grade gliomas, is the most common fusion that we identify in the cohort. EWS fly, which is the, the canonical fusion in uh, human sarcoma, would be the next most common. Uh, but one of the interesting things here is that we, you know, we identify the so-called canonical fusions but we also identify a fair number of patients who have um, likely oncogenic, but essentially private fusion. So they're only seen in that particular tumor. Uh, we've never seen them even in this fairly large cohort of a couple of thousand pediatric cases. So for example, this EWRS BEND1, MEF2D, NTRAC1. So there's a lot of interesting biology that you can start to pick up uh, even from a, a commercial, I mean, from a clinical clear certified assay such as this one. Similar on the adult side, although we tend to think of <clears throat> fusions as being more prevalent um, in pediatric populations, and that's uh, certainly true across the board, but we see a, a significant number of fusions in adult cases as well. Some of them are very well known, like the temporous ERG, as I mentioned. EML4 uh, ALK is a common alteration in, in um, adult uh, lung cancer. And uh, 
there's a variety of other ones, but also again, uh, these ones that don't have an X in them that, that are kind of low frequency are sometimes seen maybe in just one or two or three patients. So there's a lot of this underlying biology of rare uh, uh, fusions that are in some cases oncogenic drivers and in some case, cases potentially even druggable for an individual patient. So um, as I said, we were also very interested in, in looking at the germline. So in those cases where we have the tumor normal pair, we're also able to, to identify um, germline alterations and inher inherited alterations. And if you look at a, a textbook in uh, pediatric oncology that is you know, maybe more than 10 years old, uh, the, uh, the sort of um, dogma was that uh, inherited predisposition to cancer was actually pretty unusual and maybe it was like four or 5%. And our data and other published data at St. Jude's um, uh, and others have demonstrated that that's actually not true. You may be not be able to see it very well, but in our cohort, it's actually about 15% of pediatric cancer patients that have a, um, a genetic predisposition. The most common one, uh, probably familiar to all of you, is leaf Romani syndrome, which is um, generally caused by mutations in P53. And that's the, the top, uh, top hit here. Uh, the second most common is... Um, alterations in, in NF1, uh, which is a neurofibromatosis, uh, retinoblastoma, and then a, a long list of, or what we, what we call sort of a long tail of less common alterations. And one thing I wanted to point out here is that you might think, well, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's obviously bad news for that patient to have an inherited predisposition, but, you know, what, what can we really do about it? What's the clinical relevance? Well, it turns out that there's now, you know, a lot of evidence accumulating that, um, you can develop protocols to follow these patients closely. For example, the most latest recommendations for the leaf Romani is that these patients get um, uh, uh, um, frequent whole body MRIs to do early detection so that you can identify, for example, I have a, a patient that I took care of who uh, we diagnosed with an osteosarcoma uh, who's been followed with whole body MRIs. And now we know that she has a low grade glioma, so we can follow that closely and make sure that um, that, that doesn't um, continue to to grow. <clears throat> so uh, so the, you know, I think the, the clinical relevance of this in pediatrics, I think, is, is certainly clear. And I think uh, increasingly also uh, in adult cancer, uh, very clear. Obviously, we, we all know about the BRCA, BRCA inherited predisposition, which not surprisingly is the top hit in our data set as well. But again, there's a, a long um, uh, tail of, of other mutations that um, for which there's increasing evidence of, of their relevance. Uh, for a variety of cancers, um, and, and the, the frequency is actually not that much lower than it is in pediatrics. It's, a, it's about 12% in our adult cohort. So, you know, just something to, to think about. Um, uh, one thing that I should mention, uh, because it's clinically relevant, if you order a test that only has the tumor but not the germline, you may see, for example, a BRCA2 mutation uh, in the tumor. Um, you don't know whether that's, um, that's a germline alteration or not until you do the, the germline. The other thing we see also is, is quite common, which is there will be patients that have, say, a BRCA1 or BRCA2 alteration in their germline, uh, but the tumor is actually unrelated to that. So there's no evidence of a second hit. There's no evidence that that's the reason why they developed the tumor that you're seeing in the clinic for. So both of, things can be, both of those things can be true. And that's another reason why it's helpful to have the, the germline in the together. So the, what I mentioned to you so far is what we like to call a sort of a um, first order alterations in these, uh, in these uh, sequencing reports. And then there's something that we call uh, second order alterations or things that you wouldn't necessarily see evidently when, from looking at the report. But if you do kind of deeper analytics on the, um, on the data, you can identify them. So the, the most kind of well known is what we call tumor mutation burden. So this is not the mutation of any particular gene, but it's if you look at the um, the entire footprint, uh, as I said, our footprint is about six megabases, and you quantify the total number of variants uh, over the total footprint of that panel, that gives you a number for the, uh, and of course you have to have the, the there are, although there are ways to do it without the germline, but it's much more accurate if you have the germline for the reasons that I described. And the reason that that's important is because we now know from work done over, over the last uh, decade or so, that patients who have, who have tumors with a higher mutational burden uh, that uh, TMB often uh, is reflected in the higher percentage of neoepitopes that are presented on the MHC to the immune system, and therefore can elicit a, uh, an immune response. So if you, for example, treat these patients with a, 
uh, PDL1 checkpoint inhibitor, uh, you're more uh, likely to get a response um, in those patients. So now uh, this is an FDA approved uh, indication for the use of checkpoint inhibitors if you have a tumor mutational burden of, above um, generally what's uh, 10 is considered hypermutated. So if you have a TMB higher than 10, then you uh, um, there's an FDA approval for pembrolizumab or other uh, checkpoint inhibitors. So uh, we can you, we can take the data from the UCSF 500. Uh, this is the work of a postdoc in my lab, um, um, uh, Henry Martel, who then went back and looked at all the tumor normal pairs and analyzed the uh, the, uh, the TMB. So, um, for example, not surprisingly, the tumor mutational burden in skin cancer, which is caused by generally caused by exposure to UV radiation, uh, is quite high. Uh, other tumors, for example, bone and eye, have a much lower TMB, but overall, in our cohort, um, uh, over 300, 340 cases would be considered to be uh, uh, hypermutated and therefore would, be, would qualify for treatment with a checkpoint inhibitor. In pediatrics, uh, again, maybe not surprisingly, the percentage of patients with a high TMB is much lower because uh, these patients have not generally not been exposed to years of, of, uh, of, uh, of carcinogen exposure of one kind or another. So much lower percentage, although we do have a, a, a fraction of patients that have hypermutated cancers. And a lot of these uh, oftentimes are from two things, either um, uh, genetic predisposition to uh, a, a hypermutated phenotype, or um, uh, they're hypermutated because of some of the exposures that they got to some of the chemotherapy. So for example, temozolomide for the brain tumors or cisplatin for the, for the sarcomas uh, generally will generate a very high uh, uh, mutational um, load. Uh, we also look at something called mutational signatures, <clears throat> which is one of the questions that I posed at the beginning. This is something that maybe may not be so familiar to all of you. So you can look at the, uh, the mutational, um, any particular uh, mutation in, in the genome in the context of the trinucleotide, uh, the trinucleotide in which it occurs. So is it a C to G that's, that has a, a C at the, at the uh, five prime and a and a T at the three time prime, that is one particular context. And then uh, if you do that uh, across the entire genome uh, using some uh, sophisticated um, mathematical approaches, you can uh, basically uh, uh, identify what are the trinucleotide contexts in which a particular mutation occurs. And that can define a mutational signature, uh, which is characteristic of uh, particular types of genotoxic stress. So for example, here, this is the, uh, the, the mutational context in which uh, this uh, mutation for this particular patient occurred. So there's, uh, you can see here an enrichment for C to T alterations uh, in different uh, trinucleotide contexts. Um, and then you can, using the uh, matrix, uh, negative matrix vectorization, you can break that down into its, its subcomponents. So here's what we call signature one, signature two, signature five, and signature 13, uh, which are, if you put them together, um, will basically recapitulate the, the overall mutational context of that patient. And so some of these signatures are now well known to be caused by specific um, uh, genetic alterations. So for example, uh, cisplatin, as I mentioned, is a very particular kind of pattern. Uh, um, uh, UV uh, exposure gives an, another pattern. Uh, APOBAC, which is a, a, a um, defect in RNA editing, gives a different pattern. And some of these have um, clinical applications. So for example, if you have a, a repair deficiency, that will generate a particular mutational signature. Some of those uh, are, are uh, this, the subject of um, uh, synthetic vulnerability. So for example, treatment of, uh, of patients with a PARP mutation, of BRCA mutations with PARP inhibitors would be one example. Treatment of patients with an APOBAC signature with immunotherapy, as, as we demonstrated uh, in a case report recently of a patient that we took care of who had a clear cell sarcoma, um, clear cell sarcoma of the cervix uh, that was widely metastatic and had a complete response um, and is now cured uh, after treatment with, um, uh, with checkpoint inhibitor. Um, so we, we can look at these um, in our cohort as well. Uh, so these are some uh, examples of, of um, in the pediatric cohort. As I said, we tend not to see as much mutational signature because most of these patients don't have a high mutational burden. Uh, but we do see, for example, in the CNS cohort, uh, a significant number of patients that have um, uh, alterations uh, that are likely due to either a, a genetic predisposition or treatment with temozolomide. Um, <clears throat> in the adult cohort, it's a much uh, richer 
uh, um, variety of mutational signatures. I uh, won't have time to get into all of them here, but you can see the different colors indicate the, the different uh, uh, etiology of these, um, of these mutational signatures. Again, some of them are caused by intrinsic defects in, the, in, the, uh, in that patient's DNA repair mechanisms um, or uh, some of the uh, um, environmental or chemotherapy exposures um, that you can see. So you, you can basically get a, um, uh, a history of, of what that DNA has been exposed to over time from the, you know, uh, or from the germline of that patient all the way through the um, UV exposure, uh, all the way through the environmental exposures or the, um, or the chemotherapy exposures. And then um, moving more towards the, you know, the, the drugability of this data, or what does this mean in terms of finding therapies for these patients? Uh, we can look at across this cohort, we use a, 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 um, a categorization that was developed by Sloan Kettering called the Onco KB, which is similar to the one I described earlier. Category one is FDA approved therapies and that indication. Category two, A is standard of care, uh, that's FDA approved. Uh, category two B is, um, standard of care biomarker uh, in another indication. So for example, if it's, let's say, um, EGFR is approved for uh, treatment in lung cancer, but you have a patient with uh, pancreatic cancer that has a similar mutation, that would be uh, to be all the way down to four, which is basically preclinical evidence, right? So to be able to recommend that a patient who has an alteration get a particular therapy, we usually stick to one, two A, two B, um, and perhaps three A, and not so much so you can see that in the pediatric cohort, the number of patients that have an FDA-approved uh, biomarker uh, for that indication is, 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 is very small. Um, and this you know, basically just underscores how much work we still need to do in terms of finding therapies for most of our patients. Most of our patients who get the sequencing done are in the gray, which means that we have essentially nothing to offer them, at least from the point of view of targeted therapy. Uh, you know, there's some some indications where we do a little bit better, but most of them are either uh, level two or uh, 3A and very infrequently a level one. In the adult uh, world, it's a little bit different. We've done a little bit better. So for example, lung cancer, which you know, when I started my, uh, my uh, fellowship in, in, uh, in 1999, uh, there was essentially no uh, targeted indications. Now, you know, over 70% over, uh, of those patients have a very specific indication uh, the first one was EGFR, but now with the uh, KRAS inhibitors, we have lots of, well, of course, we all know that that's, they're not, in most cases, cures, but at least we have something to offer patients. Similar in uh, thyroid cancer, um, and in some indications, it's, it's, it's lower, but, but um, we're doing better, I would say, in adult cancer than we are in pediatric generally. So one of the, uh, and then just the last few minutes, I wanted to just touch on what are we doing with all this data in terms of learning about um, our patients and, and what, we, what we're doing for them in the real world. Um, and so we've built a, a pretty extensive infrastructure at UCSF in collaboration with the Baker Institute for Computational Health Sciences, led by my colleague Atul Butte. Basically take the data from, we use EPIC, uh, I don't know what uh, we use here, um, but uh, we use EPIC uh, and then extract information from APEC from EPIC and what we call it APEX, which is the UCSF version of EPIC. Um, extract that into tables uh, that can be queried uh, computationally uh, in the database called Clarity, which then gets uh, put into the blue box, which is the de-identified version of Clarity, which is uh, uh, we call CDW. Um, and I should say, I, I don't do this because I, I couldn't code if you will put a gun to my head, but uh, we have colleagues who know how to analyze all this data and extract the information and help us identify how well are we doing. So we, you know, we, we're sequencing all these patients. I told you we sequenced over uh, 8,000 patients. We discuss these cases in molecular tumor board. We recommend that patients get treatment X, Y, or Z, but then how do you know that the patient actually got what was recommended, right? And um, that, you know, that's, uh, I think you'll see the data, but it's a little bit sobering because you realize how much more uh, work we need to do to really make this information um, relevant to our patients. So this is just a preliminary analysis that was done by a, a PhD student in the tool abuse group, Michelle Wang, uh, who actually does know how to code and can take all this information from CDW and pull it out. And there's lots of filtering steps here, uh, which I won't have time to get into, which tells you, which is why the numbers here that we're actually uh, looking at are much smaller than the overall cohort. But it, essentially it has to do with, uh, in order to be able to determine whether a patient got 
the drug, they actually, first of all, had to be a patient that we took care of at UCSF. So it can't be a patient that was seen somewhere else and then just came for sequencing. They asked, we also have to have follow-up on that patient. So we have a lot of referrals, maybe went back to the community. But we, we can't really uh, look at that data. So these are only patients that received all of their care at UCSF. Also, um, we, we, we cut off this data two years ago because we needed to be able to look at, um, at you know, um, uh, longitudinal data. So it's a relatively small data set, but the point is essentially that we have the analytics now to be able to look at this going forward and really um, get a, a sense, you know, how are we doing in the real world in terms of, you know, are the patients um, getting the, the drugs that we think they should be getting. So here for, for this small cohort that we've looked at so far, the patients in the, in, on the left side, the red, uh, these are patients uh, in the top uh, line here that had lung cancer who had a recommendation uh, for treatment uh, based on the ECSF 500. And uh, 114 of them did not get the recommendation. Only 84 of them did. And then you can see the similar data uh, going down the line. So lung is the biggest group, so it's the easiest one to analyze. Uh, Michelle, as I said, you know, uh, knows how to pull out this data. Um, can do things like, for example, look at um, <clears throat> when did this patient get uh, diagnosed uh, and when did they get their treatment uh, started uh, after the diagnosis. So one thing we can say is that in all of these cases, they got the UCSF 500 report and they got initiation of therapy very close to the point when they got the UCSF 500 report, which is what you would expect. This would be considered standard of care for lung cancer. It would be surprising if they didn't have this blue line or the uh, starting right at the point where they had the diagnosis. And then we can also see um, uh, how long we, we, we care for them at UCSF or how long they stay on the drug. Uh, and, uh, you know, are they still alive or, or did they, they die of uh, disease? So this is just very preliminary and we're still digging into a lot of this data to try to understand what it means. But we're excited that now we have the ability to link the genotype to the phenotypes in the clinic and really um, learn um, uh, from this, you know, what we call it real world, you know, or as much as UCSF is the real world. Um, uh, so I, I thought I would just end with a, a couple of quick case studies that kind of bring this uh, down to, uh, to you know, individual patients. So one, uh, these two case studies focus on um, what we learn when we do the comparison of the germ line with the tumor. So this is the case of a patient who had a, 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 a alteration in, a, in TDK and 2A, which is a T16, which is a tumor suppressor, uh, which is a, um, defines a, a germline predisposition syndrome called melanoma astrocytoma syndrome. Uh, these patients have a, a risk of developing, as the name implies, melanoma and astrocytoma, but also a variety of other uh, alterations. So this patient came to us uh, with this report. So they had uh, the CDKN2A deletion in the germline. Um, and then uh, a second uh, hit uh, on the other allele uh, for the CDK into a gene, which, as I said earlier, is a strong um, uh, like demonstration that this tumor is likely uh, initiated by the by the first hit in the genome, um, and then the second hit um, in the somatic uh, tumor genome. Um, uh, this patient had a very interesting <clears throat> um, and complex uh, personal history with. Uh, uh, a history of uh, several tumors in, in the proband, and also a uh, complicated family history with a paternal grandfather, paternal uncle, both who died with mel of melanoma, a sister who died of glioblastoma. You can put together these uh, really complex um, family trees. Uh, this was done by one of our genetic counselors. Um, and so this, this is a case of a patient who obviously has a, uh, a very uh, high risk genetic predisposition who came to us um, and then now, uh, because this was the, sort of the index case, now we have, a, you know, we can bring the other family members to the uh, cancer predisposition clinic, do much more careful um, uh, follow-up and, and, uh, and potentially uh, prevention uh, for this, uh, this family. This is another uh, really interesting case that, uh, that I saw of a patient who uh, came in with a diagnosis of doing sarcoma um, uh, by the pathologist, and that was confirmed by the presence of uh, EWS Berg fusion. And in most cases of Ewing sarcoma, that's all we see. We don't see any other alterations. Um, that's the only driver. But this case, this patient had a really interesting finding. So they had in the germline uh, an alteration in NF1, so the, um, uh, which is neurofibromatosis. 
and they had some clinical evidence of neurofibromatosis. So they have the kind of classic cafe au lait spots on physical exam. Um, and if you had not seen an NF1 alteration in the, uh, in the somatic tumor, you might say, well, this is probably just sort of unrelated, right? So the patient you know, is unlucky enough to have a genetic predisposition to neurofibromatosis, which will potentially later in life lead to other sarcomas. But the Ewing sarcoma is not one of the ones that you would associate with that. And it's probably just unrelated. However, you see here that there's a second hit on the other allele. So that kind of really made me, you know, kind of piqued my interest because um, uh, we study neuro Ewing sarcoma in the, in the lab. We also study RAS driven tumors in the lab. And there actually is, if you dig in the literature, significant evidence that RAS plays a role in Ewing sarcoma. So from, you know, preclinical studies that people have done. Um, so we started, you know, we, we, we started digging into this. Um, and, uh, and again, this is just kind of a little bit more of the analysis of that tumor. So here's the uh, germline NF mutation and, uh, and another mutation in the other allele. Uh, and uh, if you look in the literature, you will find evidence that, you know, RAS contributes to the pathogenesis of Ewing sarcoma um, in various uh, preclinical models. Um, and there have been other descriptions of patients who had alterations in the RAS pathway and had Ewing sarcoma. So this suggests that probably, you know, really that the RAS, RAS signaling pathway does play an important role and underappreciated role in the pathogenesis of Ewing sarcoma. So again, these are the kinds of um, sort of uh, insights into cancer biology that you can gain uh, from this kind of uh, uh, clinical data. So I'm gonna end there, uh, leave a few minutes for questions. So just to summarize, uh, gene sequencing of tumors uh, is uh, well-established at UCSF, but obviously I'm sure uh, widely done here at Creighton as well. I think we can learn a lot about the cancer diagnosis, treatment, and detection of germline risk, but also as I hope to have shown you, uh, gain some insights into um, <clears throat> etiology and the biology of cancer. I did a little bit of uh, work here, contrasting what some of the alterations we've seen in pediatric cancer and adult cancer. I think we can learn a lot from those kinds of comparisons. Um, and uh, lastly, in the last few minutes, I hope to have shown you some evidence that uh, although tumor sequencing is now widely available, we still have a lot of work to do to, to make that um, as valuable to our patients as we can and to bring that, uh, that promise uh, to reality uh, in the real world. So I just wanted to end by thanking the members of the team. We have a, a fantastic team of discussants for our molecular tumor board uh, mentioned here. Uh, pro, uh, a lot of the work that we do in the Medical College Initiative really would not be possible without just uh, what I consider to be the world's best uh, program manager. Uh, her name is uh, Michelle Tursky, and she has a great team of clinical research coordinators that help her with that. And then, of course, the, uh, the computational team, uh, which really makes all of this possible. 90% uh, of this work is really uh, heavy duty computational analysis. And that's been done by Henry Martel in my lab, as well as uh, Carlos Espinosa and uh, Courtney Onagera. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for a great talk. Very educational. We'll open the floor for questions. Talk to us. Uh, thank you. That was fabulous. Um, I spend a lot of my time in lung cancer. And as you alluded to, it has been such an exciting space, uh, especially over the last decade, as we've sort of continued to unlock the bi biology of the tumors that we're treating. Obviously, some of our ongoing struggles are biomarkers, right? And so not PDL1 never being a perfect biomarker, or trying to combine it in some ways with TMD. Um, but perhaps something that I think about more when we struggle more when we talk about it at every targeted meeting is that many of our treatments, especially these targeted therapies, are static as opposed to cytal. And you alluded to that um, in one of your slides. And, and trying to think about strategies to keep cell lines under control, but also keep sort of the majority of our clones being something that we can control um, because it becomes problematic when we start to develop the growth of the, the clonal variants within a tumor that we don't have targeted agents for. Um, what do you see sort of as the future for how we approach sort of these targeted therapies? Are we gonna be combining them in more unique mm -hmm. ways with, with other agents to get more of a cytal type um, effect or, or where are we heading with that? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, I think the uh, perfect example of that is um, uh, all of the um, 
recent developments with KRAS inhibitors, right? Which everybody was so excited about because you know we've always thought you know, KRAS is a you know such an important oncogene. You know, was considered to be undruggable for so long, and then work from my colleague uh, Kevin Chokat and others at UCSF demonstrated that you actually could block activity of KRAS, and that's been shown now in clinical trials that yes, you get some response, but you know all of these patients defer within months, right? So, um, which has been pretty disappointing. So, how do you turn something like that into something that really kills the tumor. Yeah, I think combination therapy is going to be key. Um, I think uh, we still have so much more to learn in terms of how to, uh, as you said, you know, turn these, these therapies into title therapies. Um, combination with other targeted agents, combination with, uh, with uh, chemotherapy. Um, it's hard to do combination trials, as you know, right? I mean, it's hard to get um, drug companies to agree, right? So, you know, most companies don't want to put their drug in combination with another drug especially if it's from a different company. Uh, they're expensive trials to run. Uh, they're also, you know, you increase the toxicity. So none of these agents are benign, right? So the, um, um, they almost all have pretty significant side effects. Um, and, but in terms of, you, I, I'm going back to your question, I think the other thing that I didn't really get a chance to talk about here, but I think is an exploding area that's also turning out to be really exciting is um, liquid biopsies. So ability to... Um, do a lot of the sequencing that we're talking about here, but not from a tumor, but actually from the from the um, plasma, the patient's plasma, because um, tumors release tumor DNA into the plasma that can be that can be detected in the plasma. And the advantage of doing it in liquid biopsy is that you're not just sampling from one tumor, but you're sampling from all of the tumors that that patient might have, right? So if the patient has metastatic disease, if you just go after one biopsy, then you're going to miss you know what's happening in the other metastatic sites. So that's a really exciting, and there's some super exciting stuff happening now with um, liquid biopsies, where you can not just look at um, mutations, but you can also detect uh, epigenetic alterations by looking at what DNA is wrapped around nucleosomes and what DNA is not, and things like that. So I think it's a uh, you know the next five, 10, 15 years are going to be you know a really exciting time in in, um, in molecular oncology for sure. Yeah, but your questions were really spot on. Uh, Dr. Kim. Great talk. Um, I had a question about the lung slide where you had recommended uh, the 114 that uh, didn't get the recommended and the 84 that did get the recommended. Do you have any more granularity as to the why? That yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, um, a lot of that work, you know, as you can imagine, is, is pretty painful, uh, you know, going into each medical record, trying to figure out what happened. I mean, you know, there are some obvious reasons, like uh, if the patient got their sequencing you know, too late, right? Um, you know, maybe they were already pretty sick or they were, you know, advanced tumor uh, that paid that they may not have, um, they may not have been eligible uh, or decided not to get the treatment. But there's probably a variety of other reasons. I think we need to do a lot more kind of careful curation of the medical record, particularly to identify those things where we could actually have an impact, right? Um, I mean, in some cases, it might be um, uh, insurance issues. Uh, it could be uh, access of one sort or another. Um, or it could also be because um, the clinician decided that um, they were going to try a different option. Maybe they have mutation, but maybe they, you know, they have more than one possible, uh, you know, uh, treatment course, and, and the clinician decided something else. So we need to look into that more carefully. I have a question for you. So there is also the, the term precision surgery, uh, in addition to precision surgery. Where do you see the role of surgery with the molecular? How can we integrate them together better, either to predict timing of surgery or hold off on it? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I haven't thought about that uh, too much. I'm going to be curious to see what, what your thoughts are. I mean, maybe the area where it's it's most most ready for for uh, discussion is, is thoracic oncology, or <coughs> because um, there's been so much progress in the in the um, in the, you know, the molecular diagnostics for that. I think it's going to depend um, on the tumor. I mean, the other area I think uh, would be uh, uh, neuro-oncology, right? Because those patients, uh, um, uh, those tumors actually evolve a lot over the course of the, of the treatment. So when is it appropriate to do surgery? I guess one way to think about your question is, um, and this comes up a lot, is um, when is it appropriate to do a, a second operation to get a, a look at the, at the tumor 
because it's important to understand how it's evolved, right? In some, in some cases, that may not be so relevant because the oncogenic driver is going to be the same driver. But in other, in other situations, that could evolve, especially as a, the therapies arrive, right? So in the context of care augmentation, you know, therapies, you, is the tumor that comes back, is it KROS mutant or is it something else? So that, you know, sort of defining the guidelines for, for uh, rebiopsy, I think. Really important. Almost hearing an R01 with Gillespie Al-Rafai with you. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? Yes, sir. Okay. Nice, nice job, uh, said talk, uh, Dr. PJ Himong. So what are the challenges in maintaining the in-house uh, molecular uh, testing department? Why we have so many commercial uh, testing yeah, in, yeah. The, in the- um, uh, Well, the challenge is, is, is the, uh, the investment, right? The infrastructure. Uh, I should have mentioned, I know we don't, we, I don't run the, the lab itself. The lab is run by the molecular biologist. It's called the Cancer the Genomics um, CCGL. Cancer uh, um, sequencing lab, genomics lab. Um, so they have a very large infrastructure of uh, molecular pathologists and you know the people who do the processing of the samples and all of that. So it's always a kind of a um, a debate. You know, is it better to do that in house or is it better to just send it to a company? The reason that UCSF has decided to do it internally is because, um, as I hope I showed you, we have total control over the data, right? So we can. We can well two things. One, we can we, we have total control over the assay, right? So for us in pediatrics, that turns out to be important because a lot of the commercial tests they don't particularly care about pediatrics, so they don't include all of the mutations that we care about. So that's for us very important. Um, but also, you know, if there's a uh, particular interest in a in a research topic or in a particular kind of cancer, you know, they will are very flexible about adding those probes to the assay so that you can, you know identify those things as well. But I think probably the most important one is um, the access to the data, right? So we have access to the raw data. We can put it into our databases in real time. We can analyze things like, you know, tumor mutational sequencing, tumor mutational burden, mutational signatures, um, all of that. Um, and I think that that turns out to be to be important. I mean, I think we, we've done a, a pretty good job. I would say that um, the, the most famous in-house lab is probably the Sloan Kettering Group. I mean, they've done an amazing job because they have you know, just incredible resources to um, not just to do what we've done, but also to learn from that. So they, you know, they've probably published you know, I don't know, 50 papers by now um, from all aspects of, of what they've learned from the impact of the assay. So I think there's a huge upside in terms of um, research uh, uh, capability from having an in-grown uh, you know, in-house assay, but it also requires you know, an investment. Any questions from colleagues on Zoom or from Phoenix? Yes, we do have one on the chat that I'll go ahead and read. First, they say wonderful work. And then she asks, I'm interested in how you are considering moving from sequencing of a panel of onc TSS to whole genome or whole exome sequencing. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So we do quite a bit of whole genome sequencing and uh, not, not so much whole exome, but we do a lot of RNA sequencing and whole genome sequencing on the discovery research side. So I'm giving another talk at three. On osteos are coming, I'll talk a lot, about, a lot about the whole genome sequencing work we've done there. Um, I think the, the value of doing that on, in a clinical setting is, uh, is I think, debatable. Uh, if you, particularly the, um, the cost benefit, right? So it's, the issue with whole genome, well, it used to be maybe five years ago that the issue was cost, right? Because it was so, it was maybe a couple thousand dollars just to do the whole genome. Now you can do a whole genome for probably less than $500. But the issue is the computational cost, which is still quite significant, right? Right To process the data, but also to analyze the data. And then at the end of the day, what are you bringing to that patient that is, um, that is uh, clinically actionable? As opposed, you, know, you can learn a lot from, about research for sure, um, but in terms of actionability, uh, unless you're looking at things that are like unrelated to the cancer, like you know, predispositions to disease of one sort or another, uh, which you could probably get from the whole exome. But um, I think what, what do you learn from the whole genome other than sort of very specific, somewhat boutique situations like you know, certain kinds of pediatric cancers that were very driven by structural rearrangement, like osteosarcoma, things like that. 
it's not clear to me that there's that much added value to doing whole genome, especially if you consider the additional costs cost of the um, of the assay, the the computational biology, but also the the analytics downstream. Right? So what are you going to do with all that information? So on the discovery side, I absolutely agree. I think it's whole genome sequencing is fantastic. On the clinical side, I'm not sure that it's justified um, in most cases. Thank you. Can I ask a um, follow-up last... question? Please, to yeah. that? Dr. Hansen. Yeah. All right, yeah, Laura Hansen, that, that was actually my question. Um, and so I don't know, you know, I, I look at the, I mean, it's great work. It's, you know, it, it's exciting and, you know, it's clearly having patient impacts as you sort through all the data. Um, but I, but I don't know, you know, you talked about the sort of mismatch between the cancer related genes on your panel and which ones of them are druggable. Um, so I, I I don't know if this is this I think this is your panel that you developed, but I wonder if I don't know, you know, there's a bigger set of genes and there's a lot of discovery research, as you mentioned, that uh, is finding roles for a lot of genes or proteins in cancers that, you know, there are drugs for completely separate indications that um, yeah, I don't know if you fine tuned your panel to focus more on, of course, the hereditary ones, but also the, you know, druggable, like a set of kinases or receptors, et cetera, maybe more broadly that that might lead to more, I don't want to say creative options, but more, more novel options of, you know, potential drugs that might be useful for certain patients? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, well, the, the panel of 520 genes that we have included here covers almost anything where there is a known targetable biomarker, right? Um, so it's right. not like we're missing things like, you know, mutations that are well known in cancer. I mean, could we be missing mutations that are drivers for an individual patient? It's possible, uh, mm -hmm. although I will say that um, if you think it's hard, you know, I showed you the data showing that getting drugs where there's a clear indication to patients with lung cancer, which is like, you know, probably the number one, uh, you know, sort of uh, poster child, is still difficult. You know, we're at less than 50%. So then go from that to figuring out how to get mm -hmm. a drug for an individual patient where you think that, that maybe is a driver for that patient. You have mm -hmm. to convince the drug company that to give you the drug. You have to convince the clinician to give them the drug. You have to convince the patient that that's in their best interest. It, I, I'm, I, I think maybe in the future that's possible, but I think um, if you're looking at a sort of real world application of precision mm -hmm. oncology in 2024, we're not really there yet. You know, we, maybe we need better analytics. We need, you know, everybody loves to talk about AI. Maybe we need AI to tell us, you know, this is what you should target. But I don't mm -hmm. think we're really there yet. I mean, we have made quite an effort, for example, to bring RNA sequencing in to making those kinds of decisions. And it turns out to be just difficult to do. Mm. Um, but, Thank you. you know, probably something we should think about.